All right, so next up, uh, as we continue to fight our way towards lunch, um, Kevin Brown from Schneider Electric is going to talk to us about lessons from Retail at the Edge, how technology is changing the store experience and redefining mission critical. Welcome. And I got the clicker. Okay, so I think I, am I the only thing better than the power? You know, the power and cooling guy is the only thing between you and the, uh, what's happening as well. Uh, anyway, thank you very much. Um, I wanted to, we wanted to share with you a little bit about uh, Edge and some of the things that we've been focusing heavily on retail and some of the, just wanted to share with you some of the things we're seeing uh, from the retail industry as a focus. We've talked a lot about 5G, we talked a lot about other areas, but there's some, uh, we find the uh, retail uh, to be an interesting area as well. Um, there we go. So this is our model of the edge, yet another one that you see. But, uh, you know, at the end of the day, we, we, you know, we try to keep things simple so that we can understand it. But at the end of the day, I think it, there's going to be these three models in the world. That you have a centralized cloud. We certainly know that's going to be there. The local edge is a lot of what we were talking about. A 5G cell tower is an example of a local edge, kind of the first point of connection that you're coming into. And then there's this amorphous regional edge that also plays, right? And I think one of the interesting things as we've been talking with different people in the industry is we get very caught up in where is all of this occurring and is that a regional edge or a local edge? And, uh, you know, and it's a very interesting conversation, but certainly there's a lot of action happening at the local edge, right? And in the earlier presentations we were talking about 5G. Um, um, and for us, we find this a, a pretty interesting area. So we're really today just talking about the local edge and uh, what's happening there. So uh, there's been some discussions on this as well, is that you, you know, there's been these best practices in the centralized cloud and regional edge. And we, about a year ago, we published a white paper that we called Resiliency at the Edge. And I'm just quickly giving you an overview of that so we can get to kind of what we've learned since then. But uh, you know, there's this argument that what we've had in best practices at uh, centralized cloud and regional edge, you know, at the end of the day, I go through many closets and we've gotten better as an industry, but a lot of them look like that, right? So you take this highly resilient, very reliable tier three, tier four, whatever design, and then we connect it into something like that. And uh, that starts becoming the weakest point, okay? And so for us, you know, what's the mission critical aspects of this? I mean, as power and cooling guys, this is the most of the things that we're really trying to understand is what's becoming mission critical and, and do we need to start applying some of the things that we've learned at the data center to an environment like this? And the reality is, it's not going to be the same. We're not gonna do the same tier three, tier two. I don't believe that's gonna be the case, but that type of thinking needs to start being applied at that level. You know, it's kind of also, we need to change our way of thinking as an industry. Uh, we make the argument that, you know, for the most part, our current paradigm is we tend to think of failure as like, you know, the power went out and an IT rack was impacted. And then we talk a lot about application resiliency in the cloud and what have you. You know, but when you look at what's happening with the generational change that's occurring, and I think the LinkedIn conversation was interesting about how fast does my app load on my phone, that's becoming the critical issue, which is the new paradigm, right? We have to stop thinking of an industry about that I keep the data center up and running, and you have to start thinking about that you get the experience that you expected from your app. And it's a completely different way of thinking. It sounds small, but it's actually quite profound when you start doing that. And you run into some interesting math of, uh, you know, pick your favorite number. We, we picked some percentages. Uh, we modeled this out and said, you know, centralized cloud data center, say 199.98%. And by the way, I hate talking in percentages because of this, because no human brain really understands what seven nines means, right? So we translate it into 1.6 hours of downtime per year, right? It's much more meaningful. I can relate to that number. And the thing is, if you take it and you say, I'm going to connect that into, we model it out as a tier one, and it's got an edge data center availability of 99.67 instead of 99.98, that doesn't sound like a big difference, does it, right? You know, it's a very small percentage. But the reality is now, if you take those two together, your downtime is about 31 hours. So it's about 20 times worse than what we think it is when you connect in from a highly reliable centralized data center into something like the edge that we just showed you. So it's 20 times worse than what we think. And, uh, and if expectations are going up, in terms of what the performance is going to be, then we need to start changing the way we're thinking about this problem. So that's our, we have a white paper on that that goes through the math and how we model that out and it's publicly available. Happy to share it with everybody. So then we said, okay, this was a nice theory that we had that we put out, but is the resiliency at the edge theory true? 
right? And that's always an interesting challenge to give yourself. And so we really started over the last year trying to study retail. There it goes. So the question was, is it even real? So retailers to me is a fascinating case study because they're all doing one thing. How do I survive against the Amazon? They're all trying to deal with this same issue. So it's really, you know, there's, there's a lot of dynamics going on inside of retailers. So uh, we said, uh, this is a study that was done. We got the quote there. 72% of them say they lose sales during a network outage. 82% say that network downtime results give them a negative customer experience. And they wait up to four hours when an outage occurs, right? Because this isn't necessarily power and cooling, but this isn't any kind of an outage. This is, so the retailers are saying this is a real issue for them. And more importantly, <laughs> their consumers are saying it as well. Okay, so now you're in, a, you're in a business that you're struggling to survive. 31% of consumers told family and friends about negative in-store experience. I don't know about you guys, but if I have a negative store experience, or really, if anyone in my family has a negative experience, trust me, I hear about it, right? You wouldn't believe, nobody said, greeted me, nobody did whatever, right? So it's not just about the network, but then 48% avoid those stores based on negative experiences. So now you're in a business, you're struggling to survive against Amazon, you're trying to figure out how you're gonna survive, and you've got numbers like this that you're facing. This is, a, this is really uh, quite compelling, we think. So then the question we said, so that kind of convinced us that you know, there is something happening here. Um, so is retail really deploying new technology? Is it having an impact on the IT systems, right? Because then it doesn't matter, right? Is there new technology or something happening that's changing it? Is that having an in impact on the IT systems? And then of course, we're self-serving. We like to sell power and cooling and physical infrastructure. The question is, are we seeing changes in the infrastructure as a result of that? So these are the things that we've been uh, looking at. And uh, it, since we started this, we've seen all these guys start talk, announcing at least closing some stores, if not going out of business completely. Okay, so it's not, this is not, this is like life or death for the retailers about can they get this right? Because they all believe one basic thing, which is technology may, may be my way home. Because if I apply new technology, I should be able to give my customers a unique in-store experience that you cannot replicate in an Amazon website. So they're all trying to figure this out. So we're gonna try and give you some examples of this about how do they do it. So they're fighting back, they're, you know, again, pick your favorite buzzword here, right? IOT, you know, my marketing people won't let me do a presentation without buzzwords. So we've got IOT, augmented reality, and artificial intelligence, all of those being used, right? And they're, they're scrambling, trying to figure out how they do that. And I'm gonna give you some more specifics, but you get like the magic mirrors, the one in the middle, where I can stand in front of a mirror, click a button, and it'll show me what I look like in a new suit, right? I don't even have to go try stuff on. I can just go in a dressing room and they can try that. And then if I really want to try it on, I can go get the actual garment and, and do it. So I don't have to walk around the, the store trying to figure that out, okay? And there's people talking about in-store robots. This is kind of scaring me a little bit, but uh, uh, we're getting into that. So the reimagined brick and mortar space. This is uh, pretty interesting. So the first one I talked about is kind of the magic mirror. You can see she's in the mirror and this, this is being rolled out today, right? And we talked to a retailer, when they roll out this technology, it's changing what their requirements are for availability in their local edge, right? And just a quick tangent, by the way, is I think we've done a horrible disservice to ourselves calling it edge computing. Because you know what word everyone gets focused on when I say that? Come on, we've been going a while. Somebody throw one out. There's only two words. Pick one. <laughs> it's compute. Even today, when I was sitting listening to these presentations, everyone talks about compute. Now, at the end of the day, does it really matter if there's compute going on or if I just have to make sure that my network connection is available, right? <laughs> and certainly what we see is power consumption is going up because of this technology that's being put out there. So I think in the case of 5G and latency and serving the app, and I'm not saying it's wrong worrying about where the compute is actually occurring, but you've also got to think about just, if this thing is mission critical and consuming power, how do we make sure that's up and running? How is that application still up and running? And what does that need to look like? What's that resiliency level need to look like? And I do think it's gonna be different than traditional data centers. But anyway, so you got the clothes you can try on, apparently you can try on makeup. So this is something that they're working on. So I can stay in front of it and uh, try different makeup schemes, which uh, you know, sounds like fun, I guess. Uh, you know, Amazon is now actually putting in brick and mortar. Right, so they have an Amazon Go store. You walk in, there's nobody there to check you out, apparently. I haven't been to one yet, so I want to try this. But all of a sudden, I can walk into a store. There's actually nobody there to check me out. So, so think about the, the, the technology needs to happen there. Um, McDonald's, I don't know if you've ever been in front of one of these. This is uh, real stories from Kevin. I walked into a McDonald's. They said, no, 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 we want you to go to the kiosk. I went up to the kiosk. I kid you not, I started working on the kiosk. The thing went out. 
So I went back to the McDonald's person. I said, why'd you send me to that kiosk? They're like, yeah, it's doing that all the time. It's a pain in the ass. Why don't you come over here? Now I'm sitting here going, you morons, right? What are you doing putting me in front of this thing if you don't have it figured out, right? So that's another piece of equipment that's now being relied on so that you can come in and place an order. It's actually quite cool when it works, right? But these guys, this is the type of thing that they're trying to employ. And then I guess there's like virtual showrooms now, right, where they're going to show you different stuff depending on the day that's coming in. So this is stuff that's uh, kind of being reimagined today. What's also scary is mannequins watching your facial expressions, right? This is happening now with artificial intelligence where, you know, they're, they're going to look at you. There's uh, Affectiva is a company that's working on this where they can actually sense what your emotions are based off of a computer looking at you, right? So talking about mannequins being able to do this. Facial recognition of VIPs. Suppose I walk into a store. This is real stuff they're talking about. I walk into a store. It knows who I am. It knows what I bought. They're going to direct me to the things that they think are going to be most interesting based off of my purchasing history, right? Think about the difference in the in-store experience. If I walk up, I walk in, and somebody comes up to me and goes, oh, here's four shoes that we think you might be interested in, right? Here's a new jacket that we think would fit. Because your last jacket you bought four years ago, and you smuck, you know, you've got to get time for you to upgrade, right? This is all real, and they're going to be able to do it by me walking into a store. I'm not going to have to talk to anybody. They're not going to have to have an RFID tag on me. They're going to be able to recognize me just by who I am. So this is not in the realm. This is not Star Trek type stuff. This is in the realm of reality. But think about now, if that's what you're driving towards, if there's any interruption in that service, what that impact is going to have. It can go very quickly in the other direction. And we're seeing this is what the, 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 uh, uh, is impacting these guys. So uh, this is uh, news clips. I always love pulling news clips into my presentations. But th you know, this is what they're really talking about, is what's my IT infrastructure need to look like? What does it really need to be? Okay? And I'm going to tell you something. I do not believe it's going to be a traditional tier three. I do think network connectivity. We're seeing, seeing a lot of people looking at dual network connectivity coming into these. And they're using wireless, you know, cell phone wireless as the backup. Right? Maybe that becomes primary in the future or what have you. But either way, it's becoming network, the network redundancy is becoming critical. You know, but do I need like generators sitting at this site? Maybe not. Maybe I put in two hours of runtime using lithium ion batteries. It doesn't necessarily have to be the same as what we did in a data center, but we got to start comprehending what is the amount of uh, insurance policy that you want to buy in order to maintain that in-store experience that you've worked so hard to deliver with technology. Okay? So, uh, and as part of that also, uh, and this is just more data. 27% say uh, their IT infrastructure is able to support. So that means 73% think they're in trouble, right? And 20% said they had to delay or reject a rollout of new in-store applications as a result of IT limitations. So here it is. Can you imagine being the CEO and you're going and saying, look, I, I'm trying to survive against Amazon, and you IT guys are telling me you can't do it? I mean, that's not going to be tolerated. We're seeing this pressure start to hit, right? It's really, it started coming over the last year or so. Um, on their technology. So again, a little bit about the in infrastructure. So certainly a move towards converged infrastructure, dual ne network activity I mentioned, a lot more beacons and NFC technology is being deployed. We see that happening. Um, I'm going to talk about remotely managing the IT infrastructure. You know, we've talked about lights out, but how do we actually do that as an industry? Uh, and, and we've got some thoughts on that that I'll share in a second. Uh, you know, I always like to talk about, you know, you talk about cy cybersecurity. I mean, I walk into some of these stores and literally the janitor has the keys to the networking closet. Right? or the server closet, or what will be the future micro data center. I mean, you know, physical security, if somebody can get on your network, you're dead, guys. Right? I mean, at that point, you know, if there's a hacker, if they can physically get on your network, you're dead. But yet, all these cybersecurity tools that people are putting in place, what are we doing about physical security at this very local edge? Historically, retailers ignore that because they've been so cost focused. They're just, you know, they're like, it's fine. The thing's in the back. Nobody can get there. We already know of examples of where that's created a problem. So these are some of the areas we're focusing on in converged infrastructure. In convergence, there's a lot of words in convergence, right? A lot of meaning in convergence is it's not only kind of convergence for our, from our standpoint of the physical infrastructure, but are they deploying hyper-converged systems, converged IT? That's, you know, a lot of the software is starting to abstract out what's happening at the hardware level. So there's a lot of evaluation of that happening as well. 
So we need robust architectures. We don't know exactly what those are yet, but we know it's involved security, redundancy. And then the other thing that we're seeing take hold much more strongly than in the past is simpler standardized deployment. So I talked to one retailer, we had a meeting, and it was an interesting meeting. He goes, you know, we're deploying this stuff, and we've got a rack and a UPS and everything else. And, you know, and he said, you know, is there a way that you can make sure that my rack remotely, I want it locked down so that nobody else can get to it? And I said, sure, but why do you want to do that? And he goes, well, the problem is there's some new technology we're deploying in the stores, and those guys keep taking their stuff and putting it into my rack, right? Because they're using a third party. They were trying to move fast on, I think it was the magic mirror technology. They were trying to move fast on the magic mirror technology. They had a third party coming in, deploying that technology, and they were putting something into the rack that the rack wasn't designed for. Now, I kind of looked at that and said, geez, why don't you try and figure out how you plan for that? Right? But their thing was, I just want to lock them out. Those guys, you know, I don't know what they're doing. I'm trying to prevent them from hurting me. Right? Um, so it's kind of an interesting thing. So a lot more around how do I make it secure, safe, standardized, reliable designs, and easier to deploy and manage. Uh, now we're getting into the propaganda part of the presentation. I mean, we've been working on this at Schneider for a while. There's, you know, and we have examples of Edge anywhere from, I, I kind of agree, somebody else had a 50 to 175 kilowatt. You know, we draw the limit somewhere around 100 kilowatts for local Edge because that's, Realistically, what I can fit in one box, you know, if we do different density levels and if we get creative, we can get, we can probably move that up a little bit. So somewhere in that 150 kilowatts is the ultimate limit. For retailers, it's much smaller. It's much more like these one rack deployments that you see. And um, we have three real use cases that we've done. I'm going to go through this quickly in the interest of time, but fast food restaurant change. And again, this was much more about trying to get more efficient in their deployment of new technology and their in deployment of systems. They actually asked us to integrate everything and ship it out. They got a 20% reduction in lead time when we did that. So that was a good thing for them to be able to do compared to the way that they were doing in the past. And it was because new technology was hitting them, they had to rethink how they were doing their deployment. And when they rethought it, they actually were better at the end with the new technology than they were how they were doing it before with lower technology in the stores. So, um, and again, a lot more about how do we, you know, the, there's, there's a movement towards how do I centrally control what's being deployed out at these local environments. We're seeing a lot of that uh, hit us. There's a clothing retail change, similar story. You can kind of see the, uh, on the right-hand side where they got pre-validated. A lot of this stuff is still low power. I mean, it's a 2.2 KVA for a 42U rack, right? So it's not necessarily the amount of power that makes it mission critical. I think that's something else for our industry. We tend you know, if this is the only connection point from your customer into their experience, it becomes mission critical. And this is uh, regardless of what its power consumption is. So I think we're going to see these things that are very low power actually being treated as mission critical. And the, there's evidence of that happening in this case anyway. And then this one where it's an outdoor uh, recreation retail chain. And just so you know, it's real, right? I don't know if you can see that picture on the left is what they had before. And the picture on the right is what they ended up with after, okay? And there's a unique microdata center that we put together where it actually looks like a piece of furniture because they didn't want people to know it was a data center, right? So it actually just looks like a, you know, a little wardrobe or something that they have there. Also, it's incredibly quiet so that you can put it into an office environment, okay? But there's another dynamic we're seeing is maybe why do I have to take up floor space that's valuable retail floor space in order to have my, uh, my, uh, a, a dedicated room for my mission critical IT equipment? Right? And so we're seeing some people look for where solutions like this, where they can deploy something highly secure, quiet, and uh, that you, you wouldn't know had uh, IT equipment. Um, and I do think in order, so we talk about the management problem, I wanted to come back to this. I think the only way you solve the management problem is going to more of a cloud-based management solution. And I can tell you right now, we are taking everything we have and we're pivoting into cloud. Okay? And uh, again, we're not abandoning our on-premise solutions, we're gonna still have those but we think you have to go to a cloud-based management. And it gets into, when you look at what's happening, the amount of data that we need to collect and analyze is so, much, so large that doing that with a purely on-premise solution is difficult, might be possible. Um, and we're starting to see, and I'm gonna give you an example in a second, but the remotely monitoring and managing is what we're seeing is customers now are asking us to help them, right? So the key thing is becoming, how do we see the exact same data about what's happening in their edge data centers as what that customer is seeing? Because right? right now, the traditional model is the customer has a problem, they have their management tools, DSIM, whatever, they see a problem, they call us up, and they let us know that they have a problem. And then they start telling us it's this UPS with this serial number, you know, here's, here's what we're seeing, here's where it is. Well, if I could look at that exact same data, that, that conversation goes away. 
because I'll know exactly the same thing they do. Okay? So I think when we talk about remotely monitoring and managing, it's also who gets visibility and who do you want to have visibility. Obviously, we have to make this secure, but it becomes much more powerful if everybody is seeing the same thing because collaboration gets better on how do you resolve the issue. Scalability is always interesting. Um, you know, I, I have a story I tell where, you know, in the 90s, we were working on a software management platform, and we were really happy because we got to scale to 10,000 devices, which for us was a big deal at the time. And, you know, and it's, as it inevitably happens with these things, I went to a customer, and the first customer I met with, he said, can you get to 10,001, <laughs> right? So here it is, I, you know, we spent all this time, we scaled to 10,000, we still didn't hit the number. It was always a moving target. So in the cloud, you don't have that problem. Luckily, you know, gamers and everyone has saw, have solved this problem for us. So our scalability issue starts to go away. And then, <coughs> excuse me. And then obviously, uh, the ability, if I get this on the cloud, big data analytics, artificial intelligence, all of that becomes easier as well. So uh, this is a real story. Uh, we did the, so when we actually deployed this, we have a retail chain that we've worked with for years, okay? And just so you know, 2,300 stores, 35 megawatts of power. 35 megawatts of power. I, you know, that's bigger than a lot of data centers, right? It wasn't too long ago a 35 megawatt data center would have been considered big. I know it's not anymore, right? But that would be a big data center. There's a lot of power that these guys are managing. So anyway, we, uh, all we did, they, they've been using this for years. They've been using our on-premise software. We went in, we put in some new software. We connected all of that information into the cloud. And these are the results that we got, okay? So we res resolved their active faults from 70 to 10. They improved their store stability by about 80%. And most importantly, we estimate that freed up 3,600 hours of their, their employees' time to go work with their customers, as opposed to working on physical infrastructure. And that's the number that really got their attention, okay? And, uh, you know, and, and when we did that, this is also a piece of what we think is, it's not only the ability to have the cloud-based management, but it's the ability to go and resolve. Because what started happening was we connected into what we call our regional service bureau. Our regional service bureau had access to our partners and our field service experts, where our guys were actually going out and resolving problems in, custom, in that customer's store before their management knew about it. Because our guys were seeing the exact same data they were, and we were able to do artificial intelligence plus take action on it. Okay? And I'm done. I can see you, the hook is coming. So anyway, this is kind of a summary of what we've got. Hopefully you found some of this interesting. We've been studying it and uh, we're seeing a lot of interesting developments uh, on the retail side. So hopefully it's complementary to some of the other things we were talking about earlier with 5G and the rollout of 5G, which also we think is an interesting area as well. So uh, anyway, thank you very much. So you wanna do questions or are we out of time? Thank you. Okay.